The summer of 1934 hadn't been ideal for Adolf Hitler so far. In June, he had been forced to act against his own SA as they were calling for a second revolution which would completely ruin all of Hitler's work so far. After being pressured from all sides, he finally decided to take action and on June the 30th, one of the most infamous events in the entire history of the Third Reich took place, the Night of the Long Knives. In just the space of two days, dozens of people were killed, including old grudges, as well as the original targets, the SA leadership. Hitler's exact involvement in the non-SA killings is unclear, but regardless, dozens laid dead. At home, he was applauded all over the nation for his bold move. However, abroad, it was a totally different story. The press, quite understandably, jumped all over the event. To them, it sounded like something out of a despotic king's court from the Middle Ages, as opposed to an event from the 20th century. They didn't like Hitler beforehand, but now they had something very real to pin on him. A month later, Hitler's international reputation was sabotaged even worse. However, this time, he had almost no involvement at all. The Austrian National Socialist Party attempted a coup against the Austro-Fascist regime run by Chancellor Engelbert Dollfuss. Germany's southern neighbour didn't have an entirely foreign ideology to that of Germany's, but it certainly wasn't exactly the same. Dollfuss's movement was extremely Catholic focused, and he was determined to keep his nation separate from Germany, so as to protect their unique Austrian Catholic heritage, as opposed to embracing the greater German whole. Both nations were dictatorial, and fascism and national socialism certainly have their similarities. The issue, however, was always with the United Germany question. No matter how similar the ideologies were, it didn't matter if Austria and Germany were not united into one nation. Even in Austria itself, many felt that this was the natural endpoint of a centuries-long historical process of unification. Ultimately, things came to a head, and in July, the putsch began. Dolphus refused to leave the chancellery, despite being warned that his opponents were coming, and he was shot in the neck for his trouble. Hitler was immediately blamed, and on the surface, that certainly looked to be the case. Austria's southern neighbour, Italy, rushed troops to the border to protect from any German involvement, and the foreign press condemned Hitler for meddling in other nations' affairs. There was nothing Adolf Hitler could do to show that he was innocent on this charge, and so, to the majority of the world, and to history itself, it appeared to be his doing. Hitler wasn't the only one suffering under the stress from all this fallout, however. Another was President Hindenburg. Before we begin, very quick disclaimer. This is a series about Adolf Hitler, so by its very nature, the topic is controversial. However, I will express no opinions of my own, especially not political ones. Please use common sense. Secondly, this is part of a larger series on the life of Adolf Hitler, from start to finish. You can easily view this on its own though, but if you do want to start from the start, then the link is in the description, or on my channel homepage. And lastly, a huge thank you to my Patreon and subscribe star supporters, as always, who keep this channel afloat. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do this full time, like I am going to be doing in a few weeks time, so I cannot thank them enough, and it means the world. Thank you. The recent crises rocking Germany were having a profound effect on the already gravely ill Hindenburg. Last time Hitler had met the old man, he was barely able to talk and was fading, but now he was racing towards death's door. The old man was declining rapidly, and the question of who would fill his shoes wasn't entirely solved. Before the Night of the Long Knives, Papen had been scheming to sideline Hitler and take more control for himself. In this case, presumably, Papen would be the one to take the presidency upon the death of Hindenburg, on the grounds that Hitler could not control his SA and the military would have to be called in. Then, a military dictatorship would rule, with Hitler as a figurehead chancellor, and Papen holding the real power with the army as president. The death of Rom and the other SA leaders changed this, however, as Papen's bluff had been called. Hitler could, in fact, control his rowdy SA, and now the issue was solved. All that remained was to secure a smooth transition when the time came, and Hitler could be both president and chancellor simultaneously, as no one else had anywhere near the influence of the Fuhrer to be qualified to step into the role at this time. Regardless, when Hitler got the news that Hindenburg was approaching the end, he quickly rushed from Bayreuth to Neudeck on August the 1st with a small party, 
Most importantly among them were two public relations experts. The old man was confined to his bed. It was a horrible iron bed, but the field marshal would refuse anything else on the grounds that he had always slept on a field cot during his army days. He also refused a robe, as according to him, soldiers didn't wear robes either. Hitler entered the room where he was received coolly by all those in attendance. Father, the Reich Chancellor is here, whispered Oscar von Hindenburg to his father. Hindenburg didn't react, and Oscar had to repeat himself. The old man didn't even open his eyes and said, quote, Why did you not come earlier? The president's son responded, quote, The Reich Chancellor could not get here until now, before continuing with, Father, Reich Chancellor Hitler has one or two matters to discuss, end quote. At the mention of Hitler's name, the old man opened his eyes immediately, as if startled, and then stared at Hitler intensely before closing his eyes again and clamping his mouth shut. Some suggest that Hindenburg perhaps expected his old chancellor and close friend, Vice-Chancellor Papen, as opposed to Adolf Hitler. This doesn't seem too far-fetched to someone who has seen someone die, so perhaps this was the case. Hitler later emerged and didn't say a word to anyone, refusing to discuss the scene. On the way home, the party stopped at the Finkenstein estate, where Napoleon had a romance with Countess Waluska. The host of the building suggested that Hitler sleep on Napoleon's bed for the night, but the Führer declined this offer. The next morning, whilst Hindenburg was nearing the end and knocking at death's door, Hitler's cabinet quickly passed a law combining the offices of President and Chancellor. The vote was unanimous and Vice-Chancellor Papen's signature was added, even though he was not there. A few minutes later, President Hindenburg, perhaps Germany's biggest hero of the past 100 years, passed away with the words, My Kaiser, My Fatherland, on his lips, and a Bible in his hands. Hitler, now officially president and chancellor at the same time, immediately got to work as this new position made him the supreme commander of the armed forces also. His first act was to summon General von Blomberg and the free commanders of the free branches of the armed forces. Admiral Rader later said, quote, we were in his study, and Hitler asked us to come to his desk, without ceremony or staging. There, we took the oath which he, as Chief of State and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, read to us. The oath went, quote, I swear before God to give my unconditional obedience to Adolf Hitler, Führer of the Reich and its people, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, and I pledge my word as a brave soldier to observe this oath, always, even at the risk of my own life. End quote. The previous oath had demanded loyalty to the president and the constitution, but this one requested a personal link between Hitler and every soldier, a specific individual, rather than the position itself. None questioned it, and by the end of the day, every serviceman in the nation had taken the same oath of undying loyalty to Adolf Hitler. Hindenburg's funeral ceremonies began on August the 6th at the Kroll Opera House, the temporary seat of the Reichstag ever since the fire. His coffin was carried past the ranks of the army, the SA and the SS, all of whom were now united by their oaths to Adolf Hitler. Despite Hindenburg's explicit wishes to be buried at Nudeck, the following day he was buried at Tannenberg, the scene of his greatest triumph in the First World War. His body was placed in the centre of the gigantic monument. Hitler walked over to the coffin, and at the podium he realised that his adjutant had laid out the wrong speech in front of him, after an awkward silence that puzzled radio listeners all over Europe, he continued on. He produced one of the shortest speeches most had ever heard him deliver, and ended with praise for Hindenburg's military and political achievements. The final words were, And now enter thou unto Valhalla. A nod to the Marshal's battlefield heroics that probably wouldn't have been appreciated by the very Christian Hindenburg. Hitler kissed the hands of Hindenburg's daughters to end the ceremony, and General von Blomberg was so moved by the moment that he impulsively suggested to Hitler that he be addressed as Mein Führer by the armed forces instead of the usual Herr Hitler. Hitler happily agreed. Later that evening, he called Papen and asked if Hindenburg had left a political testament, and then asked Papen to quickly acquire the document and bring it to him. Papen then sent his private secretary to Nudeck to collect it, and the man returned with two sealed envelopes, which Papen immediately gave to Hitler. Hitler seemed extremely displeased with the contents, and said, quote, These recommendations of the late president are given to me personally. Later, I shall decide if and when I shall permit their publication, end quote. 
Rumours immediately began to swell that Hitler was deliberately suppressing the field marshal's wishes, and at one point, his foreign press chief Hampstegel brought it up at dinner time. Hitler responded, quote, Tell your foreign friends to wait until the document is published officially. I don't care what that pack of liars thinks. On the 15th of August, the testament was released, and it was full of praise for Hitler and his regime, but strongly stressed the importance of the army as a symbol of the new state. Rumours began to swirl once more, this time that the document was doctored. However, Hindenburg's son came out to deny such things, and swore that his father had always supported Hitler, which in a way was the truth. Hindenburg had seen Hitler as his natural successor, and no one else made sense to take over his role as president. The old man did find many aspects of National Socialism rather detestable, however, but over time Hitler grew on him more and more. These rumours were mostly just from the typical crowd in the foreign press, however, and at home things were looking up for Hitler. On August the 19th, a referendum was held on Hitler becoming president, and a resounding 90% of the German public voted yes to the motion. In doing so, the German people were willingly voting themselves further into a dictatorship due to how much they trusted Adolf Hitler and his vision for Germany. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed these two shorter episodes of my series on the life of Adolf Hitler. The two topics didn't really fit with the other videos, but next time we're back to the long ones and we'll be covering the remainder of 1934 as well as 1935. A final thank you to my Patreon supporters who make these videos possible. If you'd like to join our Discord, our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, or if you decide to support the channel, then please do consider clicking the link in the description. Even the $2 tier helps immensely. Thank you to Lobster to You, Darwe Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr. Bloom, Gab D, Gaius Longanese Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rocksaka Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, and Haste, as well as Inflection Point from Subscribe Star.